Hello, everyone. Welcome to our team engagement live session today. Um, really excited to have you all join us. I've, I've been hearing in some of the feedback that people are, uh, a lot of you eat, eat your lunch during our session. So if that's the case, I hope you're enjoying a delicious meal. Um, for those of you that haven't been on before, I'm Noelle Smith. I'm the CEO and co-founder of TeamGage. We are the world's first team engagement software. And I'm thrilled today to be joined by Colin D. Ellis. So thanks for joining us today, Colin. Oh, well, nice to be here. Um, I, for those of you that haven't come across Colin before, he is an award-winning international speaker. He's a four-time best-selling author, and I've got one of his books here, and renowned culture change facilitator who works with organizations around the world to help them trans transform the way they get things done. So really excited to have you here today, Colin. Thanks so much. Very generous introduction. Never <laughs> thought I'd write, I'll be honest, I never thought I'd write a book. I've never, it was never one of those things like, oh, I really want to write a book before I die. Yeah. And I've written six in six years, which just six. seems bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, I don't, some of you might've seen my LinkedIn post, but I walked in, we have a brand new, huge Dimmix bookstore in the city in Adelaide. And I went on the weekend with my daughter and I went over to the business section, as I do, and I saw this book, Culture Hacks, and I was like, well, that looks interesting. And then I saw your name and I was like, oh, perfect. So as I, I said to you before, I'm partway through it. I haven't finished it all, but really enjoying it and enjoying the really um, simple takeaways that, that you can action with your team in there. So excited to finish that one off. I am... Um, there's a lot I want to talk to you about today and we only have 20 minutes so we might um, get started with a, a really kind of high level question but from from all the work you do tell us who do you think is responsible for culture within an organization not messing around here Noel are we straight, straight into it the curly you don't have long no um uh, everyone's responsible for it, Noel. Every single, every single employee of a team of an organization, every it's everybody's responsibility. I think often the senior leadership team are seen as the people who have ultimate ultimate responsibility, and I, it's kind of justified because they really have to be the role models for everybody else. You know, yeah. Often, what we do is we ape what we see, we kind of copy what we see, and so if we yeah. see bad behavior at a senior leadership level, then then you know we tend to copy we shouldn't do but we tend to because we feel that we've got permission to do so yeah. uh, hr are the custodians of it but it's up to them to make sure that culture is seen as something seen as a serious investment of time and money uh, but really culture belongs to every single individual everybody's got to come to work with the right attitude the right mindset they've got to you know stay disciplined and focused to do their job they've got to have courageous conversations with each other and challenge each other to to be the best that they can be and also to yeah. deliver on the promises that they've made so let me throw something at you because i actually don't disagree with what you said there but i have heard you know, it said many times before, especially around setting goals, that if everyone's responsible, no one is responsible. Yeah. So what would you say to that in regards to culture? Um, you can't, uh, for something that's living and breathing, it, it, it's, like, it, it, it's like saying who's responsible for the ocean, right? Yeah. Everybody is responsible for the cleanliness of the ocean. Everyone's got a role to play. Um, and, I, and so I understand the very old fashioned term, but I understand it, but I understand it. The thing is, is because culture is a set of micro experiences, everybody has got a role to play in making sure those micro experiences are positive. What we want to do, Noel, often is we want to put someone on the hook for it. And, you know, you speak to any HR leader and, and it's this eternal battle that they have um, to justify culture initiatives. Right. And, and because because senior leaders see it as HR's response, you look after the culture. We need a learn and development program. Now, it's more than that. What we need is a set of behaviors. All right. Well, we'll just bring some external people in to design some values. No, everyone's got a role to play in the definition of those values. You yeah. can't create a sense of belonging and a sense of can't flap in my arms by I'm getting really serious. You can't create a sense of belonging and a sense of connection. If people don't feel that they have a say or, or don't feel able to contribute to it, or if they don't feel that it represents who they are and what they stand for, mm. you know, and we've seen during, you know, particularly during the Ukraine war and prior to that with Me Too, Black Lives Matter, this real rise of employee activism. 
and employers are starting to recognize, hey, we've got a voice here. We can actually influence inside. You know, for, for too long, culture's been driven top down when really all of the work takes place bottom up. You know, and certainly in the work that I do, I help everybody on the ground and at the top, we kind of bring everybody together to demonstrate that, that everybody has a role to play. So I think HR is ultimately accountable for making sure that culture is taken seriously and that's a whole other issue, but everybody does have a responsibility. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I think um, you've nailed it on the head there as well, where you say it's bottom up and top down. It's, you can't have it purely top down um, but in the like, the same way, you can't have it just bottom up because that, that turns into chaos or people leave if they're not seeing it being led by example from the top as well. So um, I think that that makes a lot of sense. So you've mentioned sort of everyone's responsible and, and HR being the custodian. So then what is the role of, of a senior manager or a team leader in regards to culture? Well, it's, it's their role to make sure that they're doing their bit to uphold the purpose of the organization, the vision of an organization and create a really awesome subculture, Noel. So we don't, the, the, the biggest challenge most organizations face with culture is they don't understand it. And so what they do is they say, oh, changing culture is hard. And what that allows them to do is put it in a drawer over here and never come to it ever again because it's hard to do. Yeah. When actually, if you, if you take the time to really understand what culture is, it's really not that hard. Um, and what it requires is every manager, every employee does their bit. So as a senior manager, it's your responsibility to make sure that you build something that has that sense of belonging, that has that connection to what the organization is trying to do, but also has an identity that the people within that, within that subculture can connect with. Yeah. And so that they feel that sense of pride. They feel that sense of ownership. But... It's working towards, you know, kind of the purpose of the organization, the vision of the organization. So this is where we make some agreements about how we'll behave towards each other, how we'll work with each other, how we make time for new ideas, and then how we'll kind of live the values in, in plain sight. Often what happens is we, we, we kind of define this stuff at the top level at senior leadership level and it's kind of it's not it's not wrong it's just wrong in the way that they go about it when it's just the senior leadership team okay. um because they'll define these values but then they often they're not value statements they're, they're a mix of behaviors and other things yeah and then they don't actually do any work to define how they they should be lived and you know i always say values should be lived not laminated Yes. So senior manager's responsibility is, is to turn the vision of the organization into something that has that sense of connection, sense of belonging, where everybody knows what they need to bring every single day so the organization can achieve their strategy. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I think something we see a lot as well, exactly what you're saying about, we have our values, but we haven't yet sort of embedded them. They're not yet lived. And I think um, there's a there's a whole piece of work there to to you know, work through how you can do that. But I think one of the things that's really interesting, often from the top, like the executives will set KPIs across the business that are sometimes at odds with these values they've written. So things like saying we'll be, you know, customer first, that's, that's the value we want to live. But then their KPIs in the customer centre are all around like time, efficiency and profit. And it's like, well, sometimes we customer first, we have to spend a little bit longer on the phone. And if I'm being measured on how quickly I can get off the phone. And, and so I think that's a, a, another really good example where, you know, we really do have to live them. And it's not, it's not just up to individuals. It's also some of the systems and processes around us and making sure they're aligned with our values. You know, it's, a, it's, it's a great example as well, because, you know, organizations often will have a, a value. I mean, it's a behavior, but that's OK. It's a value of collaborative and then set KPIs as like, well, so what you want is greater collaboration. And you say you're valuing it, but actually you're going to measure individual performance, not team performance. So yeah. immediately you've got something that works against one of your values yes. um, because they don't give enough. They don't give enough thought to doing culture properly. Often it's just a series of tick boxes and tick uh, values, tick, purpose, tick. You know, I, I, I wrote a blog recently about being a purpose-led organization, what it means to be a purpose-led organization. Most organizations think if they have a purpose, that means they're purpose-led. No, it doesn't. It means that every time you make a decision, you ask, is this in line with our purpose or not? Yeah. Are we treating our people in line with our purpose or not? If we're not, then you're not purpose-led, you know, you're just purpose-written. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And 
Um, it's a little bit different, but it's similar. It made me think of, you know, uh, getting asked about, you know, HR often be asked to justify what's the ROI on improving our culture or spending this money on the culture. And I always find that a bit of a funny question because it's like, well, what's the ROI of having an awful culture, right? Like that's really obvious. If you have a toxic culture across your workplace, that's really obvious that that's going to be bad for your bottom line. Um, but it seems that the other way around, that investing in culture being good for your bottom line isn't yet so obvious, but we're out, we're out here to change that message because I think there's a lot of evidence and data now to say that that is the case. Yeah, the late CEO of, of Zappos, Tony Shea, uh, I asked him this question. So I, I saw him in Vegas in 2019. Yeah. And I said about this constant ROI, ROI struggle. He said he hates the question. He said, yeah. what's the ROI of hugging your mum? You yeah. know, he said, you know, when you get culture right, it, you know, what it does is it helps people to feel happy, cared for in an environment where they can contribute. That said, Noel, HR managers should be able to rattle off the answers to what the ROI yeah. is of culture. They should be able to. It's really easy. Ben, my accent scouts. I'm from Liverpool. Um, but they should be able to rattle it off. It should be super, super easy. <laughs> Um, and you know, the, the, sometimes they don't know enough about culture, even if they have the title people and culture manager. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we've had a comment about your accent. So, yeah. um, <laughs> right, I, ben, yeah. and, and you and, and he said Cockney, then I would have taken offense. No, <laughs> okay, you know, right. you've got good with, you know, great <laughs> city. I should have said at the beginning if you do have any questions, um, along the way. Feel free to post them in the chat or the, or the Q and A. Um, we will try to fit them in. Um, what? So, I yeah bought your book. I'm part way through it. One of the chapters that I've read, uh, which I found really interesting, was um, make. It was. It's called. I think it's making time for te- make time for teamwork. And I'd I'd love you to to talk a little bit about that because it. I guess it's something maybe that people don't think about, actually making time for teamwork. What does that mean? I mean, tell us a bit about that. Well, it, it's like, and it's a really obvious thing to say, Noel. And like everybody listening to this or watching the record and be like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And <laughs> like, it's so obvious. It's like when at the start of any year, and it might be a financial year or it, you know, it might be a calendar year, the first thing that you should do is to actually make the time to come together as a team. Now it's been virtual the last two years. You know, a lot of my, my workshops, I do a lot in person. They're using them as an opportunity to bring people together and actually agree how you're going to work together. It sounds utterly bonkers, right? But you have actually agree how, how, what are those interactions? How are you going to communicate with each other? What are different people's personalities? How do we connect as human beings? How do we agree how to use the technology and the systems that we have? You know, at the start of COVID, most people went onto Microsoft Teams and just got rolled out, right? Just got implemented. It's yeah. like, oh, right, just, we're all locked down. We're going to go hybrid. Let's roll out Teams. It's, yeah, excuse yeah. me, it's not hybrid. Ticks. We've ticked yeah. hybrid work tick, now. Tick, <laughs> cult, we've, got a, we've got a hybrid culture. We've got Microsoft Teams tick. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, people aren't taught how to use it. And then people are getting emails, they're getting messages on Teams channels. Then we're looking at the little red dot and the green dot. Who's online? Who's not demonstrating a real lack of trust? You know, and, and trust is one of those things that should be assumed between team members. But it can only really be assumed if we've actually taken the time to get to know each other and actually yeah. time to build a team. Now, senior leaders justify this every year. And, you know, guilty as charged when I used to be one myself is we used to go on off-sites for two days, you know, in, in wineries in the middle of New Zealand. I remember did that once. It was awesome. Sounds great. And then I remember a member of my team said, oh, I, one of my direct reports, like, oh, I want to take my team off-site for two days. I'm like, well, we haven't got the budget. Um, you know, it's just like, well, we need to give every manager the opportunity to be able to take his or her team off-site or do something fun on-site to actually make agreements how they're going to work together, to talk about which tools get used for what and when, to talk about how badly we use email and we should stop doing that, to talk about the nonsense of back-to-back meetings and we should stop doing that, and make those agreements to each other. And once once we do that, then we get collaboration. I love that. I think, um, you know, this is, I mean, you talk about in the book about the 5% improvements, just chipping away at these little things that if you don't talk about them, they build up into frustrations and like, I, you know, the way we run meetings or the way I'm always interrupted when I'm working in the zone and 
those things over time left unchecked and undiscussed do become frustrating and, and can become big enough that you look elsewhere for a job, which seems crazy when they're actually incredibly simple to solve. So I, I, I really agree with that. I think just talking about how do people like to be communicated with? How are we working together? What can we do differently? And sometimes those little things um, around the way we use a tool um, can have a really big impact to people's day and, and productivity during the week as well. So I think, I think as well, when we make those agreements, Noel, I know we've only got 20 minutes, but I feel like I took for 20 minutes. Great, you go. Uh, it is the, you know, what, you know, what we need to do is recognize that the strength of our team lies in our differences. But if we don't actually take the time to talk about those, um, then there'll always be differences and it, we'll never use them for positive good. We'll never, we'll never get to the point where cognitive diversity is a positive trait of our team. It's always yeah. a negative because we haven't made those agreements. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I love that. Um, we have a question. I feel like it's a really big question and we're, we've got a few minutes left. So let, let's see if you can drill it down to like the top things you'd suggest. But um, someone here is saying, we have a fabulous culture that was built on everyone being together. And how can we shift this to the hybrid, hybrid work <laughs> environment? And it's okay that it's a big question. We're not afraid to tackle it. So they're apologizing for it being such a big um, question. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. So very few companies in the world are actually hybrid. Hybrid is where you come together as a team and you decide, you look at what work needs to be done and then you decide where it's best to be done. And that hybrid might mean five days in the office. It might mean five days working in a co-working space in between people's houses. It might mean five days working from home. Very few organizations are doing hybrid. Most are doing what I'm calling forced flexible. You have to be in the office Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, right? <laughs> if that's not hybrid. But anyway, so the, the, the first thing you've got to do is you have to recognize that the way that you work together has changed. So you have to redefine your culture. You have to redefine what our expectations are of each other. And what you want to do is start from a base of assumed trust, where you trust that everybody does the right thing all of the time. Because hybrid work has been possible since 2001, because I was doing it in 2001. Yeah. And what's held it back is not technology, but the behavior of managers, right? Because they doubt people's intentions. And it only takes one bad apple to spoil the fruit bowl for some yes, reason. Yes, yes. So make those renewed agreements to each other, redefine the culture, recognize that not everyone's eligible, recognize that some days you'll have to go into the office when you don't want to, because you're part of a team. It's not about you and what you want. It's about what does the team need in order to do productive work. So there has to be that agreement too. Uh, and then you need to make sure that you're set up for success. You've got the right tools. Everybody's been trained and you know how to use them well. Um, yep. And ultimately, you set yourself some targets that you, and, and some promises to each other that you're able to follow through on. What will bring hybrid workplace cultures down is either old fashioned attitudes or teams that don't have the discipline to continue to get the work done. My yep. worry is it's going to be the former this doesn't work. We'll have proximity bias. Well, yeah. I can't see Noel, so she's not as committed as Colin, who's in the office every day. Yeah. That's exactly what my boss sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I agree with that. And I think it's coming back to what you said earlier is like making time for teamwork. So going back to, to those, first, you know, what is it? How is it that we work together? How is it that we communicate? Because now that you're hybrid, it does have to change. Um, the other gold nugget I think that I constantly remind our team about is assume good intent. I think in hybrid, it's inevitable that a lot of the comm switches to tech space, which is fraught with um, misinterpretation of tone, you know, all the signals that we get from body language, smiling tone, you miss in tech space. So I would always say assume good intent if someone sends you a direct sentence and statement, don't put it in an angry tone on it. I think you usually work out pretty quickly if they are actually angry, but assume they're not to start with. Yeah. Um, how are we going? Oh, we have and a minute. Email is the worst communication tool, like the worst communication tool, because often there's no context. Also, it's an asynchronous tool, but people think it's a synchronous tool. So people expect immediate responses, which is not what 
email actually is. So they put urgent in the tagline to try and elevate it. Yeah, we're not buying yeah. that. Anyway, that's a whole other subject. Yeah, well, I think, I think <laughs> you cover that in the book as well, don't you? Like cut out email. Yes. And we did that a few years back, like did a two-week period where no internal emails could be sent. Brilliant. And it, we we barely use them internally now. And that was just, just that practice. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, we've, we've run out of time. I've got more questions I'd love to ask you, but um, it flies by. It absolutely flies by. So thank you so much, Colin, for um, joining us today and, and for your tips and expertise. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed your, your lunch. Jenna's saying, can't imagine work without emails. Well, well, there's a good challenge for you. Oh, Think about it. Yeah. Try it. it. It is possible. Um, if you'd like, we love your feedback. So I think you'll get a link to the, the feedback in the chat and also on email. So please leave feedback if you have any and watch out for the replay. We will be posting this video on YouTube. So if you want to watch it again or you miss some of it or you want to share with others, um, watch out for that link being emailed around and shared on LinkedIn. Thank you, Colin, and thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Noel. Bye.